Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dan Rundy, and I hold the Schreier Chair at CSIS. I also lead the CSIS Americas Program and the Project on Prosperity and Development. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on illegal, unregulated, and unreported IUU fishing in Latin America and the Caribbean. Before we begin, let's take care of logistics. We will have simultaneous interpretation in Spanish. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, please click the globe button that says interpretation and then select the language. Ahora en español, tendremos interpretación simultánea para la audiencia hispanoparlante. Para escuchar el evento en español, por favor haga clic sobre el icono del globo que encontrará en su pantalla y que dice interpretation. Y elija español. This is a 90 minute event. The last 20 minutes will be dedicated to questions from the public. You can submit a question by clicking on the Ask Live Questions button on the event webpage. And again, good afternoon to everybody. I would like to start by thanking the US Agency for International Development for their generous support and to our colleagues from Environmental Incentives for working closely with our team to make today's event a success. I wanna particularly thank Ben Shapiro, Christy Johnson and Mina Torres for their partnership at USAID. Thank you very much. The US has a big stake in IUU fishing. We import at least 65%, up to 90% according to some sources of our seafood and around 2.4 billion of it is illegally sourced per year. This represents about 11% of our total imports coming from IUU fishers globally. Importing massive volumes of IUU caught fish and seafood runs contrary to US development priorities in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the US can do a lot of work with the region to combat IUU fishing. The biggest challenge in the region is in combating IUU fishing is the lack of coordination. Countries have disparate laws, enforced, disparate enforcement mechanisms, and disparate enforcement capabilities. IU fishing will continue to run rampant in the region unless countries can get on the same page and coordinate responses. IU fishing is ripe for trafficking and forced labor, and this spills over into licit fishing. Artificially low wages and long hours only Achievable, achievable through forced labor and trafficking makes fishing especially lucrative for illegal and unregulated actors, which places a downward pressure on wages and labor standards in the licit industry. It's almost impossible for licit fishers to compete with IUU fishers as a result. We published an important commentary on IUU fishing in Latin America and the Caribbean yesterday. And on Thursday, we have a 35 West podcast with Michael Eddy of USAID coming out. I encourage you to read the report and I encourage you to listen to the podcast that'll come out on Thursday. This event will explore the link between IEU fishing and coastal livelihoods and economies, the environment, food security, and national sovereignty across Latin America and the Caribbean. The fishery sector is extremely important to the regional economies and the demand for fish consumption is expected to continue growing. The sector has presented Latin America and the Caribbean governments with opportunities for growth, but has also posed challenges for resource management and re regulating illicit fishing activities. IEU fishing poses a threat to the region's ecosystems, food security, economic stability, and efforts to crack down on transnational criminal activity. Unfortunately, instances of IEU fishing have risen in the region perpetrated by non-compliant domestic and neighboring fleets, as well as Chinese fishing vessels. Countries have started to install measures to combat IUU fishing from foreign vessels and have issued joint statements to curb IUU fishing in their exclusive economic zones. However, while there are elements of a legal framework in place to prevent IUU fishing, they are often under-enforced and lack visibility both nationally and internationally. To combat the economic 
an environmental devastation caused by IUU fishing and the related security issues government agencies and organizations across the region, like the one present around this virtual table today, must convene to foster dialogue that lends itself to actionable policies to combat IUU fishing. We have four wonderful speakers joining us today. I'm really grateful to my friend Peter Natiello, Senior Deputy Administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development's Latin American Caribbean Bureau. He's going to provide some keynote remarks for this event. He has vast experience as UC Mission Director in different locations, including Afghanistan, El Salvador, and Colombia. He was also Deputy Mission Director in South Sudan. Our first panelist, we have several panelists. Our first panelist is Ambassador Jean Maines. I'm so grateful that Ambassador Maines has made time for this event. She's one of my heroes in diplomacy. She's currently a charge d'affaires at Interim in El Salvador. She's coming back for a second tour at, in essence that she's acting ambassador for us in El Salvador. She previously, she served as ambassador, Senate confirmed ambassador to El Salvador. She knows the country really well. Uh, most recently, she was the civilian deputy to the commander and foreign policy advisor of the U.S. Southern Command in Miami, Florida. That is the most senior civilian job in the U.S. Southern Command. I'm so grateful that she's made time for this. She has cross-sectoral clarity and understanding of the challenges posed by IUU fishing. We also have, as another panelist, Mr. Peter Murray. He's the program manager of the fisheries management and development at the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism based in Belize. I'm grateful that Mr. Murray will, will provide a technical and perspective. He provides technical guidance on the planning and implementation of the fisheries conservation management and development program. Uh, he provides a field perspective. Our final speaker is Mr. Luis Alfaro Garfias, former Director General of Supervision, Inspection and Sanction at the Vice Ministerial Office of Fisheries and Aquaculture of Peru. He's an expert in IUU oversight. We're so grateful to have Mr. Luis Alfaro Garfias with us as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the floor over to my friend Peter Natiello to kick this off. Peter, over to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and, and, and thank you to all for joining today's webinar on illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. And of course, uh, a very special thanks to you, Dan, and to your team, to CSIS, and of course, to our terrific panelists for, for your leadership on this important topic. We're, we're here today because we share a common interest in combating IUU fishing, whether you're new to this topic or a seasoned expert, we hope today's session will be informative and useful for you. Globally, the negative impacts of IUU fishing are alarming. According to the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, the sustainability of, of global fishery resources is declining significantly. In 1974, 90% of the world's fish stocks were within biologically sustainable levels, but by 2017, only 65% remained at sustainable levels. That's bad for the prosperity, livelihoods, employment, and even food security of coastal communities around the world. That's why USAID and those we work with have long viewed IUU fishing as, among other things, a major development challenge. Moreover, IUU fishing can undermine the sovereignty of nations, threaten the critical biodiversity of our oceans, and undermine national security. And IUU fishing is often linked to criminal activities such as human trafficking, money laundering, tax evasion, fraud, and bribery. Of great concern, the situation in Latin America is no different. For example, along the coast, along the Pacific coast of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Chile, less than 50% of the fishery stocks were at sustainable levels as of 2017. Those familiar with Latin America and the Caribbean understand firsthand the region's beauty and the importance of the unique, unique ecosystems, marine ecosystems, to the environment, the region's economies, and its communities. Addressing IUU fishing is key for the sustainable management of fisheries and the protection of these important ecosystems and the people who derive their living from them. The Biden-Harris administration has made it clear that addressing climate change uh, head on, it's a key priority, uh, both domestically and internationally. Mangroves, seagrasses, and other aquatic biomass in the oceans represent an often overlooked carbon sink 
meaning, meaning they absorb and store large quantities of carbon, helping keep oceans and sea life healthy. Therefore, combating IUU fishing is an important part of the Biden-Harris administration's climate change engagement with countries in the Western Hemisphere. What's USAID's role in combating this complex problem? Globally, USAID counters IUU fishing by empowering communities and civil society, improving transparency and traceability, enabling improved uh, enforcement and, part and partnering with the private sector. For example, through our Seafood Alliance for Legality and Traceability Project, USAID is promoting legal and sustainable fisheries around the globe. In Latin America, this activity is working to connect experts and industry partners to exchange their experiences with traceability systems. In addition, in Ecuador, we're partnering with Internews to build Ecuador, Ecuadorian journalists and civil society capacity to raise awareness about IUU fishing and to advocate for increased government response. We're also partnering with the World Wildlife Fund to identify and address gaps in fisheries management and enforcement. In Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia, we're partnering with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, to help governments implement the international binding, internationally binding port state measures agreement, whose objective is to prevent, deter, and eliminate IUU fishing by preventing vessels engaged in this practice from using ports and landing their catches. In Peru, we're also currently soliciting innovative approaches to improve fisheries management, governance, and regulatory compliance. More recently, USAID identified deep water fleets in certain parts of the world as a more direct and significant impediment to improving the management of national fisheries. Based on these findings, we're beginning to consider targeted interventions in some countries to counter the impacts of those fleets on national fishery resources. As we expand work to address IEU fishing, USAID will ensure our interventions are based on relevant and robust information. This is where today's panelists and you all come in. And I should also add that because this is a complex problem, we'll continue to work closely with our interagency partners in the US government. Uh, we have uh, uh, one look at the problem, but there are other uh, views of it in, in terms of law enforcement, security, et cetera. We're eager to hear from, uh, from our panelists today about the impact of IUU fishing on the security and resilience of coastal communities and how development agencies like USAID can help address its impacts and drivers. In closing, thank you all for taking the time to join today's roundtable to discuss this important topic affecting the Latin America and Caribbean region. We're here today because we understand the importance of supporting strong and vibrant coastal communities. We look forward to a lively discussion from our panelists and questions from you. Thanks, Dan, and back to you. Thanks, Peter. Let me start with Ambassador Maines. Thanks for being here, Ambassador Maines. You come to this issue from a number of different perspectives, both from a diplomatic perspective as well as from a securities perspective. I'd welcome any comments you have on this. I'm particularly curious about how you think IU fishing affects regional security and how it bumps up against other illegal activities. But I, you may have other, you'll, I know you'll have other thoughts as well. Great, thanks, Dan. It's great to see you on the screen and thanks, Peter and so many friends out there. You know, this is an incredibly important issue. And from a policy perspective, it's quite unique in that it touches so many different things. As Peter referenced, you've got food security, human trafficking, sovereignty issues, environmental security, economic security. Um, all of those issues are sort of wrapped into one with combating illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. And that's what's so interesting about it, because normally when you're dealing with NGOs and other groups, they're focusing on one element. So you have a group of NGOs that focus on human trafficking. You have a group of NGOs that focus on environmental issues and all of those things. But this one, you have to bring it all together. And that's why you know, I often say this issue is about way more than fish. Fish are important. I grew up on the coast fishing with my dad. Um, I've seen this all my life in terms of the depletion of the fish stocks, but it's so complex in the number of different issues that play out in this space. And coming from two years as the civilian deputy commander at Southcom, we saw this firsthand. In every country we traveled to with a coastline, the top three security issues that they reinforced with Admiral Fowler and myself on every visit were combating narco-trafficking, um, cybersecurity, and number three, 
was combating illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. And I think that came as a shock to many people that that was so high up on the list. And again, I think it's because it encompasses so many of those issues, particularly economic security. So when you think about what's happening and what was startling for us at Southcom was we had already seen this play out in Asia and Africa. So it's not as if you have to reinvent what the projections are. And when you look at Asia and Africa and the depletion of the stocks, that's exactly where the path we are on here for this hemisphere if we don't take urgent action. And, and so it's not as if we have to guess as to what's going to happen. And so if we roll back the clock to last March, uh, when there were the 350 vessels from the Chinese deep water fishing fleet off the coast of the Galapagos Islands, the World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage Site, that was sort of a calling moment. And you had The Guardian write a piece on it, you had the BBC write a piece on it, do a production on it. And suddenly it was an opportunity to highlight what has been happening in this hemisphere for years in a growing number. And why would we do that? It really, the Galapagos is fundamental and, import, and important and symbolic in so many ways. Um, I think every person can picture the hundred year old turtle that you think of when you think of the Galapagos Islands, but yet that same devastating effect was happening off the coast of Argentina, off the coast of Costa Rica, off the coast of El Salvador. It's just, it didn't captivate the world's attention. And so when you had those 350 vessels off the coast, we made a decision to reach out to our friends in Global Fishing Watch, who are amazing leading on the technology front, to showcase what that looked like. And so we were able to track those 350 vessels for a two-week period and show exactly when they were entering the exclusive economic zone of Ecuador. And you track that using the AIS system, the automatic information system, which is mandatory for ships of a certain size. And so by tracking that, what people do is they turn them off when they don't want you to know where they are. And so there are two reasons in the maritime world that you turn off your system. One is if you're being attacked, you know, you have a security threat, so by pirates or something. And the other one is because you're doing something that you don't want people to know about. In the case of those 350 vessels that are a floating city, they were obviously turning it off to disguise the fact that they were going into the exclusive economic zone of Ecuador. And so we were able to track that and then show by the vessel name and number and the time exactly when they made those decisions to turn that off. And what we found in that period is that over half of those vessels, so over half of the 350 vessels turned off their device for more than eight hours a day. So for more than eight hours a day, they went dark. Now there's other technology that you can use even once they turn off the AIS system to identify that their vessels, um, depending on their heat map and some other technology that many people on the screen are aware of. And that's where I think we have a big opportunity to leverage technology in this space, how we track vessels, how we share that information with countries. And I say that because countries would ask us, can we get more Coast Guard support? Or can you help us buy more naval vessels for our own Navy to patrol our exclusive economic zone? And we can do some of that. And we are doing some of that with the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard also this year released their global strategy to combat illegal fishing, which makes it the number one maritime threat for the United States Coast Guard. It used to be piracy, and so they made that change. That's an important change. But let's be honest, there's not going to be some new thousand vessel Navy out there to patrol the seas for illegal fishing. And so this is really an opportunity where we have to leverage technology. And you have good leading partners <clears throat> in this space with Tony Long from Global Fishing Watch. You have Ian Urbina uh, from Ocean Outlaw, leading journalist who's really brought attention to this issue and the problems globally. And the key is, as was mentioned by Dan and by Peter, 
is it's an opportunity to unify the region, to bring countries together, because no one country can combat illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. We have to share the information. Uh, it is not like narcotics trafficking. So in narcotics trafficking, <clears throat> we can track the vessels and we can send out um, interdiction and get that information. And the drug traffickers just change the routes, right? So based on where we put more attention, the drug traffickers go the other way. In the case of IUU fishing, that's not an option for that because they're following the fish. So they're following the migration patterns of the fish, which don't change. And so you can actually, using technology, predict where these suspected vessels are going to be. So we took, I don't know, the last five years of data and looked at where we saw those gaps and the turning off of the AIS system and the projections based on the migration pattern of fish. And we can pretty much tell you where the Chinese distant water fishing fleet is going to be for the next 12 months. And that's the value of analytics. And that's the value of data. And so how you get that data out in the public domain, again, to leverage the generation that cares about the environment, this new generation who it is one of their top priorities, get that information in their hands and start to put that international pressure both from citizens so from citizen public diplomacy and then governments. In terms of what governments can do, you have the issue currently in front of the World Trade Organization to try to eliminate subsidies for IUU fishing. If you can believe that still exists, it does. They had a deadline of December this past year to reach an agreement, they did not. And so that's still an important item on the agenda. And it really is about setting international standards and making it unacceptable to engage in these practices. So everything from turning off your system to the types of nets you use, to the transshipment of fish, when you move fish from one vessel to another so they can't be traced. And this is exactly as Dan and Peter referenced, a huge opportunity to engage with the private sector on traceability. Uh, there is in my mind, no more important word than traceability. We've done it in other industries. We've done it in the textile industry. We've done it in the diamond industry. We've done it in the beef industry. We've done it in the wine industry. Um, we can do it in the fish industry, in the seafood industry. And this is really where we need to uplift the people doing the right thing, the companies sourcing in the right way, and then merging that with consumers who are going to put that demand on companies to ensure traceability, to ensure that that percentage that Dan referenced of, I think it's 11% that we estimate of the fish, at least in the United States, that we buy is illegally fished. And so all those efforts together are what we need to do, but it is really about bringing countries together, sharing that information, linking NGOs who are working across environmental issues, human trafficking, food security, economic development, and then bringing them all together so we can prioritize what's the most important. And to be fair, you know, while China uh, is, you know, heavily, their distant water f fishing fleet is heavily subsidized by the PRC, they're not the only players. They're the largest by far, but there are a number of other countries engaging in this practice, including um, individuals from host countries who are engaged in this practice and also going into neighboring countries. So I do think, you know, that's one of those points. Well, they're the biggest by far and uh, claim to have no knowledge about it, including in one session I heard from Asia where they wanted to propose that they would be the, the thousand vessel Navy patrolling the Asia region for illegal fishing. That's sort of like putting the fox uh, guarding the hen house <laughs> type of a thing. So I don't see that happening, but uh, you know, it is where we have to join efforts. And I think it's a huge opportunity for US leadership and bringing people together and lifting up this issue. I don't think I've ever seen in a decade that the stars are aligned on this issue to make more progress than we have 
probably in anywhere in our history. So I think we have an opportunity, but we have to move out and be aggressive and, and try to get traceability on the private sector agenda and then these issues on each country's agenda in a regional format so that we can leverage technology and leverage our relationships across the region. So I'll pause there. Thanks, Ambassador Maines. Let me turn to Peter Murray. Peter, thank you so much for being uh, participating today. I'm so grateful. I know you're, uh, you're, uh, you're gonna provide a field perspective. Please share your perspective on this issue of IUU fishing. Well, thank you. Let me thank everybody for inviting the CRFM Secretariat um, to be a part of this activity. Um, I apologize for any background noises you have. We're in the midst of a thunderstorm, and my, my system will probably pick up um, the, the thunder and, and all the rest of it, but let's move on. Um, our members, within the membership of, of our community, the CARICOM Caribbean community, it has been suggested that illegal and unreported fishing by artisanal vessels, either by national vessels in our own waters or from neighboring countries, very often is the main cause of IU fishing. Um, other forms of IU fishing tend to involve distant water vessels who are a license to fish or to transship through one state and taking the opportunity to fish occasionally in another's waters. And of course, there's outright poaching by unlicensed foreign fishing vessels within our waters. Um, we've found that a common form of unregulated, unre unreported fishing is caused by pleasure crafts. Tourists who come down in their yachts and they throw out a line and they fish within the EEZ. Um, then we have unreported data from vessels fishing under the auspices of one country, access agreement, and also unreported data from national vessels. We estimate very roughly that IU catches are between 20 and 30% of total catches in the Western Central Atlantic Fishing Commission area, the area, what FAO calls fishing area 31. Though one expert who I like to listen to opines that it's probably much more than, than that. In some fisheries, incursions are thought to be regular and the impact on the resource in a significant way. But the problem we have is that we don't know the extent. Relatively little has been documented regarding catch, uh, cases of IAU fishing. Notwithstanding that the anecdotal information suggests that it's occurring. At present, it cannot be even confirmed what species face the brunt of the IU fishing, nor can there be a good estimate of losses due to IU fishing um, in our region. But you know, one of the things we've been thinking in keeping with the wide range of case studies from around the globe, our member states are beginning to look at IU fishing as in fact a dangerous and highly organized form of transnational organized crime. Um, and one that is associated with other, other illegal, violent, and often destructive practices. A number of the case studies around the world have suggested connections between IU fishing, human trafficking, and drug smuggling. And we tend to, to think that the link with drug smuggling actually is occurring in our region. And we have the view that the recognition of IU fishing as a form of transnational organized crime, rather than purely a matter of, oh, it's a regulatory or compliance issue. To look at it as, as transnational organized crime is an important step in effectively combating it. But the problem we have is that sadly, um, in most cases for fisheries, um, the non-fisheries agencies that may have fisheries monitoring, control and surveillance enforcement put fisheries low on the priority list. In fact, we have estimated that the majority of our countries invest less than 10% of their fisheries budget in monitoring, control, surveillance, and enforcement for, for, for fisheries sector. Nevertheless, um, the CRFM as an organization and, and the non-CRFM states in the region, we are working nationally, regionally, towards the development and implementation of a range of remedial measures to improve um, how we deal with it. For example, we have the 2010 Castries and Russia Declaration on IU Fishing, which speaks about the determination and commitment of our member states, CRFM, to work together with other stakeholders to combat IU Fishing and intensify our efforts to implement the relevant international in instruments. Um, all of our member states are committed to the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy and its two protocols, and to an MCS strategy, CRFM MCS strategy. Eight of our 17 member states have acceded to the Port States Measures Agreement. And all our uh, member states participate in the Western Central Atlantic Fisheries Commission and the Regional Working Group on IU Fishing, and have actually endorsed the Regional Plan of Action on IU 
fishing. A recent study by the FAO on regional countries' readiness to implement that regional plan of action to combat IU fishing for our states showed that the paucity of financial and budgetary resources, probably the most important limitation to effectively preventing and deterring IU fishing. Training and capacity development concerning IU are the second most important needs. And the third rank was, quote, enhanced human resources, more people, unquote. Um, but it is in addressing these three limitations that we think assistance would be um, most welcome were it to be forthcoming. I think I'll pause here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Let me turn to our third uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Luis Alfar Garfias. Thank you, Luis, uh, Mr. Garfias, for being here. I wanted to give you a chance to provide your perspective from Peru. Good afternoon. Thank you for your inviting me to this seminar. Yes, I'm from Peru. Yes, I am Peru. Great. The first assigning topic is governance challenges posed by IUU fishing in South America. Such as the previous speaker mentioned, the main challenge is the level of international cooperation that will allow uh, one, the sustainability of IUU fishing, a global public good. Two, regulatory framework that will allow timely action against IUU fishing perpetrators. Third, discourage IUU fishing by demanding compliance with labor laws. Four, timely information exchange identify and monitor distant water fleets. Five, political wills to enforce under IUU fishing measures. Six, strict control of high seas and shipments. Recently, the Peruvian Environment Prosecutor Office has entered into an agreement with an international NGO that is helping prosecutors to detect and board vessels engaged in IUU fishing it is in domestic waters. The second and single topic is international bureaucratic challenges to combat IUU fishing. Strengthened strengthen in interinstitutional agreement to intervene in a timely and coordinated manner. Two, resources adequate budget to strengthen supervision and monitoring of UU fishing activities. Three, extreme bureaucratic procedures for timely intervention, clear policies and aim of command allowed for experienced processes. In this regard, it's ordered to ensure continuity, most important, to retain subject matter experts working in monetary control and surveillance for a full implementation of the poor state measure agreement. Currently in Peru, the monitoring of distant water fleets is carried out by one, the BMS of the Fisher Minister, uh, CISESAT, called CISESAT which has been installed on six ships of distant water fleets due to lack of continuity. Two, the Peruvian Coast Guard AIS. Three, the IAS of Global Fishing Watch. Four, nighttime satellite image provided for by NOAA. This is a uh, uh, Summary of the uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me ask the. There's several things that have come up in the co your comments. Let me start with the issue of what's it take to generate the political will to raise this on the agenda in different countries. There's been different discussions about 
the importance of citizens awareness. Some citizens may not be fully aware of, of the problem in these countries, uh, but it seems that you know politicians and governments have to make choices within sort of fixed resources. Let me start with you, Ambassador Maines, to talk about what's it take to generate the political will. You sounded optimistic in some of your comments earlier. Uh, yeah, I think it's a it's definitely a combination. So in terms of what I see as the most likely solution or process going forward is you have to have countries unite. So what we saw after the initial wave of media reviews on the Galapagos Islands last March is you saw Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Costa Rica coming together to issue a joint statement. Those things are very powerful because no one country can do it alone. And also, you know, we're all realists here. When one country speaks out about a deep water fishing fleet from China, you know, immediately China stops the receiving of their exports and stop, they take immediate retribution and countries know that. And so if we're just being honest on this call, you know, there has to be a regional alliance. And then on top of that, an international alliance that is providing the cover to be able to address this issue in a sustainable way. The citizen piece I see is also part of the international piece where you're creating that um, consumer demand for sustainable non-elite IOU fishing, but at the same time, it's citizens who are calling out bad actors from other governments. And so it's a combination of creating the regional alliance getting the international backing and then allowing citizens to play a role in putting the pressure on countries and actors who are not complying with international standards. So one of the things I talked to Tony Long from Global Fishing Watch is if you had an app on your phone and every time a vessel turned off their AIS system, you got an alert and it said vessel 12345 from China just turned off their their AIS system outside the EEZ of the Galapagos and it gave the coordinates. You can imagine how many 25 year olds globally would then take to Twitter to say, hey, hashtag China, why is your vessel going into the exclusive economic zone of the Galapagos, right? You can imagine what that would do in terms of mounting global pressure at the same time that you're pursuing the very complex negotiations at the World Trade Organization on subsidies, you know, on the Maritime Safe Act, improving the ports. You need all those factors to come together, in my view, to push the, the policy ball uphill. Thank you. That's fabulous. Peter Murray, you talked about sort of making, having to make hard choices. What's it take to create the political will to raise this higher on the agenda? I think in our region, we're starting to see the political will. Um, for example, our, our, our ministers of, of responsible for fisheries who meet annually twice a year, um, recently issued a statement um, at an international conference where they were referring to speaking to the question of IU fishing and seeing it as transnational organized crime. And we're hoping very soon to, to, to have a, a high level conference to, to discuss that that issue from that perspective. Um, so the political will actually is, is developing in our region, but I think the ambassador hit, hit the nail on the head in terms of the extra regional policy framework, a political framework, um, the reality of trade, the reality of if I accuse you of ABC, you, 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 you put a hold on, my, on, on, on imports from my country, that sort of thing, that's a reality. We have to live with that. Um, the, the thing is that it happens also, I'm sorry, Ambassador, um, but from Peter Murray's personal opinion, not necessarily the opinion of the CRFM Secretariat, it happens also when countries tell you that they now have the Marine Mammals Act. And so these certain things must be used to, um, and if, 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 we, if we think that your fishermen are doing things contrary to our Marine Mammals Act, then we will not import your, 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 your fish. What does that do? That encourages them to find the back door. And that means it, it becomes unreported fishing, right? It's unreported information. 
but it is generated not only by the bad, bad guys in the East, but some of our good guys in the West as well. We don't often think of the consequences of this and how it encourages this type of situation when we're doing what we need to do to protect our interests, no question about that, and it's our sovereign right to do that. But do we actually consider what are the indirect consequences of that in driving um, are, you, are you fishing from, from, from that perspective? And I think we need to start to think about that. So it means, yes, we need to sit together and talk a bit more. But when we're talking, we should not just be talking about, oh, the fisheries people talking about the, the regional plan of action and IU fishing. No, we need to get the state department people and the trade people in on that conversation as well. So that they realize that some of the consequences of their very genuine efforts can have these other consequences we're talking about. I'll stop here for now, thank you. Thank you, Peter. So bringing in, bring in various stakeholders, a broader set of stakeholders. Ambassador Remains, do you want to respond to that? You're on mute. Yeah, complete, I completely agree uh, what, with what Peter just said. You know, you need to create incentives to do the right thing. And so how do you create those incentives both in, you know, di distant water fishing fleets, but also for local economies? Because at the end of the day, what we want is resiliency in the local economy. And so, you know, what I've seen firsthand, and I'm sure many on the screen, is when you have high levels of illegal fishing, then for the local fishermen, there are no fish. And so I'll go to towns in El Salvador and you'll see, you know, the boats lined up that would normally be fishing and they're just sitting on top of their boat. And you walk by and you talk to them and they say, yeah, we, there's just no fish. So I have to go further and further out. They don't realize that that's because there's, you know, a hundred vessels sitting out 200 miles away that are, have these football sized nets that are scraping up the bottom of the ocean. You know, the guy sitting on the coast in El Salvador doesn't realize that. And so you have to create incentives across the whole structure to do the right thing. In addition to the penalties. Great. Let me bring Mr. Garfias into this conversation. I would be curious about your take, Mr. Garfias, on this issue of how do we increase political will in the Andean region? Uh, obviously, there's been some regional coordination in the Andean region, especially after the Galapagos incident. Talk a little bit about sort of the political sensitization and, and try, maybe perhaps talk a little bit about the incentives. We coordinate with uh, Ecuador and Chile very good coordination, and we have a, a, a meeting with the another uh, country of the region for create uh, these uh, uh, problems. And it's a, a one time a month, but uh, in this moment, the leader of uh, Peru is, uh, is the secretary of this uh, this meeting, the South America countries, for for this uh, IUU fishing, for this problem with IUU fishing. The main problem is the uh, coordinate with the control with the similar to to say to say the ambassador. Can I ask Peter and Mr. Garfias to talk about, Luis, Luis, to talk about the issue of technologies? She's talked about some very interesting technologies that are being applied in a number of contexts. I'd be curious about in where you are, what you're seeing in terms of new and emerging technologies being applied to the issue of IUU in, in Peru or in the case of Belize or the Caribbean, Mr. Murray. Let me start with you, Mr. Murray, and then you, Mr. Garfias. Um, the technology is, uh, uh, we, we have, but uh, it's important to coordinate with another actors because, uh, because the international laws is uh, for, uh, for very further actions. Mr. Murray. Every time you say Mr. Murray, I look around for my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Um, okay. Um, 
I think the issue of technology is something that we 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 getting a hold of now. We we come into grips with it. We recognize the utility of the existing technology, but for countries like ours in the main, I'm speaking from my 17 member countries, we resource poor in relative terms. Um, there's a cost to the utilization of technology. There's a cost to getting our vessels to put in place the technology that we can then use um, when, when we have doubts about their own illegal fishing and the possibility of their own illegal fishing. So we, we acknowledge the, the use, utility of the existing technology, but we simply, have to be honest here, the resources are not always there for us to maximize their utility. So one of the actors not in, so one of the things I took we from the process we did of doing a series of three sub regional roundtables on IU fishing in the Western and the Latin American Caribbean region was that that IU fishing was perpetrated by different actors in different sub regions and that the challenge expresses itself in different ways in different parts. So my take is, is that in the Pacific, uh, that this is somewhat a, a, a significant challenge of, of mainland China, whereas in the Mexico and uh, Mexico and Central America, it's less, that's less of an issue per se, at least on the, on the Caribbean side, and in the, in the Caribbean itself, that that's less of an issue, that there's other issues. But I want to talk about mainland China. It strikes me that, and I think one of the reasons that IU fishing has been raised on the international agenda in the last three to five years, I mean, it's been a problem, but it's gotten a higher level of attention, I think has been somewhat because of, let's call it great power competition considerations. Um, and so could Chinese government illegal activities related to IU fishing drive Latin American countries to reconsider their relationship with China on the one hand, and how might existing commercial ties and or debt financing obligation relations with mainland China among with Latin American Caribbean countries affect the ability of countries to push back against IU fishing uh, by uh, actor, Chinese actors perpetrating these sorts of activities. Let me start with you, Ambassador Mains, and then I'd be curious about Peter and Luis's comments on that. I agree with your assessment on the divisions between the Pacific and the Caribbean and where the issues lie and who are the offenders in that space. If we go to the China issue, it is going to be incredibly complex, if not impossible, for an individual country to push back on China. Um, at this point, we're in, in many countries, they're the number one trading partner, particularly if you're looking at Argentina, Chile, some others, and uh, they're just not going to, they're not going to be able to do that because again, the immediate retribution that China takes, um, everybody knows what that is. And so for me, the path forward really has to be regional unity, international unity, to hold China to international standards. Up until this point, they sort of claim they don't know what we're talking about, they're not doing it. It's like, well, you know, that's just not even laugh, that's laughable. You, you have, you know, 50, ca 50 cameras on every lamppost in your, in your country and you can't figure out where the deep water fishing fleet is that you subsidize. I mean, you know, it's just not plausible. If you wanted to control it, you could, and you've chosen not to. And, and so I think when you look at the environmental degradation, what you're seeing is now countries are realizing the economic insecurity and the food insecurity that this is producing. Whereas in years in the past, it's a cumulative effect. When you start to overfish areas year after year, now it's becoming clear what the damage is, both to their own food security, to their sovereignty, and to the environment. And, but it is gonna take a regional and an international coalition to hold China to international standards. And, and I think we've seen it in a couple countries where you know, they take great pride in their uh, brand as an eco-friendly country or environmentally friendly country or human rights friendly country. And so we've seen a couple countries take action where they wouldn't let those Chinese vessels pull into their port because they didn't wanna be labeled as facilitating human trafficking and, and uh, forced labor 
or being on the wrong side of environmental issues. And, but it is gonna be incredibly complicated and I think we're gonna to have to stand together and we're gonna to have to fight this as the international community holding every country, including the United States, to international standards and then focus on the traceability of the seafood industry. Thank you. Luis, please. Yes, uh, as an example, in January, China has threatened us uh, not providing provide uh, 19 okay. vaccines. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's similar. Uh, no, no, it's a, a, in, in this case, uh, in January, the Chinese was the unique providing of uh, vaccines, to vac vaccines to Peru. So they threatened that. Right, so that it makes it additionally complicated. Thank you, Ambassador, Ambassador Mains, and then I'd love to hear from Peter. Ambassador? Sure, on vaccines, you know, I don't, I, I certainly as the United States am, am not gonna criticize any vaccine deliveries. We are in the middle of a global pandemic and we want to get vaccines globally. I think you've seen the US step up in the last month and including, you know, 1.5 million more vaccines will arrive to El Salvador on uh, Thursday. And, but I will say what I don't like about the vaccine issue is where uh, countries have been held hostage until they have given China something that they want. So for example, you know, not giving vaccines until China gets their 5G rights or their fishing rights or the port that deal that they've been working or that to a country that is still recognizing Taiwan and they want them to change to one China. For me, that is reprehensible to hold vaccines hostage from a country until you get something in return. So I will say the United States has stepped up in the last month and we have hundreds of millions of vaccines going out globally and in particular to this hemisphere and they are donations and there is not an exchange for that. It is a global pandemic and we should all be standing shoulder to shoulder to try and eliminate the pandemic the quickest possible way. Peter. Yes, I don't think I am. I don't think I am qualified, nor is it within my pay grade, to talk about the issue of, of China in terms of your question. But um, as a professional, I think I can say that no one of our countries can push back against China or the U.S. or Germany or anybody like that. But my cooperation, and I think the ambassador said it a while ago. If we get together at a regional perspective or an international perspective to give the pushback wherever it needs to be pushed, um, then I think we can make it. But I will not even attempt to speak about one particular country or another. Okay. So let me put another question, which brings us, I think, a little bit to this discussion, which is what can forces of good do to sort of solve some of the challenges we've been talking about. I'm specifically thinking about official development assistance. That's the fancy term for foreign aid. And in some of your previous answers and some of the comments by Peter Nantiello, we've kind of put pieces of this on the table. Our commentary yesterday also put some specific ideas on the table around this. And I suspect that Michael Eddy's podcast on Thursday will also reflect this. But I want to put it to this these set of panelists, which is okay, Ambassador Maines, Peter, and Louise. What can USAID do? What can the Inter-American Development Bank do? What can the World Bank do? There are a number of other actors that should, I believe, do care about this. I'm sure the Canadian government cares about this. I, I can think of a number of other uh, bilateral aid donors that care about this, but let's just use those as examples. So let me start with you, Ambassador Maines, and think you're now back, you were at Southcom. This is your second tour of duty in El Salvador, and thanks again for going agreeing to go back to El Salvador. So from where you're sitting now, and maybe from your other places you've sat before, think about, well, okay, how could and should we be using our, our limited foreign aid to kind of respond to some of the gaps that have been put on the table in this discussion today? Yeah, when I look at, I start with the, the bigger items, which for me, the, the biggest item is on the WTO elimination of subsidies uh, that foster IUU fishing. 
And so that to me is at the top is getting that agreement done and then building, I would use aid money to build those regional and global coalitions. And again, focused on very specific things to Peter's point, you know, dividing the region and looking at technology, but then look at what's doable. So when I look at our relationship, we have a new agreement with U.S. Southern Command with Global Fishing Watch, and it's specifically to use technology, but also our analytic capability. So to Peter's point, you know, maybe they don't have the people on the ground who can then take that technology, study it and find the trends or roll up the data. But that is something that we can do from any location. And so investing in those systems that allow us to then take that information and push back in a regional and global forum. Uh, we haven't talked about the flagging of vessels, which is also a well-known item where people skirt the issues. Where the issue is going is I think you'll see countries start to buy outright the fishing plants in countries. So the fish processing plants that exist in countries, and that'll be another way they get around the fishing rights issue. And so then it will no longer be illegal. So again, I think we also need to look ahead as to where some of the bad actors are going and get in front of that. So I think there are a number of issues. And then on the community side, how do you build a resilient fishing community so individuals still have those jobs? So what we saw in many coastline communities when those fishing jobs didn't exist because there are no more fish, then those individuals turned out of necessity to providing supplies to the drug boats or facilitating gas out there to get to the drug boats. Not because they wanted to do that, but because the five generations from four of them that were all fishermen, they could not live from that any longer. And so I think those developments, sustainable development of the coastlines um, is critical. And again, from a USAID perspective, um, to Peter's point, pulling all those players together that often operate in a silo from the fishing community to the human rights community to the environmental community to the trade community. We can use that power of convening authority that we have as the United States to pull all of those players together to get results. Peter, if uh, you had unlimited access to foreign aid, what would you be spending, you know, what would you want to see the World Bank or the IDB or AID spend money on for, to meet this challenge, Peter? I would say the building of capacity. And by the building of capacity, I don't necessarily mean training individuals. I mean providing the wherewithal to utilize the existing technologies, um, providing the wherewithal to build, to, to create those linkages. I think a lot of what the ambassador has just said, I, I, I think um, I am sympathetic to what she said. I, I, I can move along with that. Um, I've been thinking recently, we have an agency in the region called CARICOM Impacts, which is basically looking at all types of beautiful things among security and surveillance and so on. And we have started talking to them. And they have actually started to use some of the existing technology, but they're limited. They're limited in terms of um, the extent to which they can utilize it and the resources with which to utilize it. And I can see some of some assistance going to them in that regard. Um, and the human resources, yes, you mightn't be able to, you mightn't be able to employ up a St. Lucia in St. Lucia, but you may be able to have somebody, uh, some human capacity in your own country that could be made available. So the building of capacity, um, supporting the human resource development, and, and also in terms of the actual interdiction, maybe um, like you did with drugs, um, when you had, you know, what's it called again? Shipwriter Act and these types of things. Maybe you could start to put some of this, this type, of, type of effort into dealing with IEU fishing. Um, because even our, lim our limitations in terms of the assets that we do have are fairly small and very often very outdated. Can't get out there. We are told that vessels from country X are coming into our waters, but we can't, we can't check it out. Uh, we don't have the aircraft resources to utilize it. So capacity is not just about training people. I think that broad thing of capacity building, uh, so providing support to our limited human resources by enhance, helping enhance what we have. Um, I think 
and, and, and then getting those conversations going, I think it's very important. And I'm really glad that, that that ambassador has seen that. Getting the conversations going, bringing the actors together, seeing fisheries as not just the silo of catching fish and selling fish. It's a big international issue. And the crime that's associated with it is international organized crime. Let's get understand that. And having understood that, bring it all together. Yeah, you can, you can dish out money, but it's not gonna help if you don't bring people together. And I think that's an important aspect. Thanks. Luis, what would you, how, where would you wanna see foreign aid applied to this problem, Luis? Yes, the coordination, uh, I think that the Sea Vision platform is a very uh, opportunity for Peru. USA uh, offered to Peru, but now we got a new president that his policy is more pro-China. So the force to make China to accept and follow this regulation is going to be difficult. So in our case, we have to wait and see what will happen. This is the problem in Peru. So let me try another question for the three of you. I agree. One of the points Ambassador Maines made and I, I, uh, is there's a significant role for the private sector in all of this. If I go to a restaurant and order fish, or if I go to the grocery store and, or, and buy fish, I have a significant role to play as a consumer. But it seems to me that there hasn't been enough attention. Consumers haven't put enough, you know, or have put kind of sporadic pressure on providers to sort of deal with sustainability and traceability. There have been other spaces where this has been better done, as, as Ambassador Maines refrained. Re re and there have been some, there's some attempts at, at this, but it strikes me that there's, a, there's still more work to do in this space and more involvement of the private sector. Ambassador Maines, I'd, I'd welcome your reaction to what I just said or anything else that my co your colleagues in the panel just said. I absolutely agree in terms of focusing more intention on the private sector and the traceability piece. I think that is, if I were looking at, you know, funding from the Development Finance Corporation or others, it would be how you jumpstart and accelerate the process to sustainability. Because at the end of the day, we all respond to the markets and the economy. And so if the consumers are insisting on traceability, then it's in our interest to um, get those mechanisms in place. And then if, you're, if you run a distance water fishing fleet or you're selling fish to the United States or some other country and you don't have that, then your fish becomes less valuable because the space where you can sell that fish starts to be reduced. And, and I think it's similar, you know, when you look at the issue that we went through on textiles or diamonds or any of those issues where we've looked at for the consumer pressure on sustainability, then that really has got to get into the traceability piece. So I would make that big investment. I think the moment is now to work with companies uh, to look at the top three or four uh, seafood importation companies. Let's start with ourselves, right? We want to lead, let's lead by example. Let's take our own companies and see what investments we can make to jumpstart the traceability standards in the industry. Love it. Peter, the role of the private sector in all this. Well, a couple of decades ago, we did some work in the Eastern Caribbean and we came up with something that we all know in theory. Consumers are drivers of fishing effort. Um, it is the, the people who utilize the product are the ones that will determine what you do to get the product. And I think the issues of traceability um, therefore is an important one. In Belize, they started for the tourism sector, um, something called fish right, eat right. And um, just to try and get the thing going, to, to, to see how the restaurants and the tourism sector can, can, can engender the right type of fishing behavior on the part of local fishermen. Um, and it's moving along fairly slowly um, because of course, there are a lot of other so social and cultural things that have been put in place. One of the things I think we must never forget is that it's invalid to take the, what happens in another part of the world and assume it will work in, 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 a, in another part of the world. Um, so I am always one 
that thinks that we have to understand the cultural drivers as well. Um, and so the so social and economic factors that will engender, encourage, or drive a you fishing, whether the I or the you or the you, um, has got to be a part of that picture. We cannot just see it purely in terms of the politics or the dollars. The social and economic factors are an integral part of anything we can do if we go to deal with the scourge of IU fishing. But the private sector um, and partnerships, the sort of partnerships between government and the private sector that can have that snowball effect and carry us where we want to go is very, very important. Luis, would you like to comment on this in terms of the role of consumers and the role of the private sector, please? Yes, the private sector in Peru agrees with all these ideas, but uh, because uh, we don't have the fleets to compete with uh, vessels to China, this is the biggest issue we have nowadays. And the problem, a special problem is the uh, uh, labor condition for the people. This is the, the main problem. Okay, we've got, we're starting to get some questions. I'd encourage the audience to send questions now. Uh, if you haven't, if you've got, let me, there are a couple from my friend, uh, Alex Kravetz, uh, who I've known for a long time. Uh, Alex had two questions. One is, um, that uh, one is they're mainly directed at ambassador mains, but I'd like Peter and Louise to, to, to consider commenting on, on, on some dimension of this. Global Fishing Watch's work in the Galapagos, which you highlighted, seems like a highly cost efficient uh, leveraging of technology to combat IU. Given as you are now posted in El Salvador, is any consideration being given to extend Global Fishing Watch's work to include the coverage of the Salvadoran coastline, even if only as a, as a pilot project and related to addition ambassador mains he asked is the u.s going to include safeguarding by the bukele administration of el salvador's ocean resources from chinese iu fishing as one of the points in the bilateral roadmap recently established during undersecretary newland's high level meeting with president bukele in june so two questions iu fishing and el salvador related to you so let me start with ambassador mains great so on illegal fishing and the partnership with Global Fishing Watch. As I mentioned, Southcom does have a new uh, expanded relationship with Global Fishing Watch. And when you're looking at identifying where major fishing fleets are, I think that's best done um, in a centralized way because you know Southcom, US Southern Command and our partners, they have assets to analyze those. So when you start to decentralize it down to a country, it's helpful, but in most countries, you're not going to have the assets and the analytical capability to really analyze what you're seeing and to make those things known. So in the case of Ecuador and Peru, you know, um, we provided detail assessments about where those vessels were and uh, at what point they were coming across to go um, into the Galapagos. But beyond the Galapagos, in terms of what you can do to protect the coastline, you really have to put in good environmental practices. And we are working with the Bukele administration on good quality development. So of course, President Bukele is promoting Surf City, which El Salvador has some of the best waves in the world. This is not an IUU fishing um, topic, but there is an issue on quality development of a coastline, which plays into the whole environmental standards. And you only get your coastline once. So once you go down the negative development, road and you destroy the coastline and you have sewage everywhere, it's very hard to walk back from that. And so we are working with the state of California. We've had a couple delegations back and forth on sustainable quality development of the coastline. And then when you look at local um, things, I know I've gotten a question online about El Salvador specifically, you know, it's not beyond me to go into the supermarket chains here and see fish that are too small and call up the owner of the of the fishing of the supermarket chain and ask him to check his supply chain and you know you shouldn't be seeing fish that are of a size where they haven't been able to reproduce and so i think there are a lot of those small things in terms of controlling 
your own supply chain in each country to ensure that the supermarkets are not selling seafood that does not meet the sustainable fishing requirements? Let me let me put a question, I think, for Luis and for Peter, which is, what can we do? This is from uh, Sebastian Vijasante. What can we do to involve key seafood markets like Europe, not only China, to create partnerships to avoid IUU in Latin America and the Caribbean? So, so Peter and Luis, please. Yeah, I've been thinking about that question because I saw it in the chat. One of the things that came to my mind is as far as I remember the EU is a member of the Western Central Atlantic Fisheries Commission because um, because they are they are it has overseas territories in the region and so it, it has a foot in the door already as as it were and maybe they can use some of their resources to assist in the implementation for example of the regional plan of action on IU fishing it's not as though we've done nothing in the region it's that we, we we've been looking at the issue but the resources that we need um the EU has been fit in from my perspective, infamous, um, famous for utilizing this big stick to say, well, um, some of the countries in the region have been guilty, their vessels of IU fishing, so therefore we're not going to bring it, take in your fish. That's one perspective of it. But the EU at the same time also has another power relation and that's with other countries, other big countries who are also involved in IU fishing. It's not just about the EU coming down on Let's take a name, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and say, you naughty incensions. Um, maybe they could say, you naughty whoever else You know what I'm saying? So I think the EU has a role to play. Europe, um, because it's, it's such a, a, a market that, that a lot of, of people target, is a very useful um, consumer end, demand side, sort of driven movement towards the IU fish. I try to be careful not to be too po impolitic in what I say. Okay, Luis. Yes, uh, we need better traceability system to avoid the EU fishing uh, uh, reach Euro uh, Europe or another regions. Uh, this is the, the key, traceability. Very good system of traceability. Let me talk about the issue, uh, maybe Ambassador Mains, you could start, and then I'd love to hear from Peter and Luis about this, but the issue of interagency cooperation, not just in the US system, but also in different governments. How do we get various governments to cooperate across agencies? Let me start with you, Ambassador Mains. So that's one of the most complex issues. When we started diving into IUU fishing from US Southern Command uh, back a year, a little over a year ago now, it was, I think we have 23 U.S. government entities that are involved in this issue in some way, shape, or form, either on the, you know, the lead in terms of NOAA or the Coast Guard or, or the USTR in terms of the trade issues. It ended up being, you know, 23 different groups. And I think the coordination of that just from the U.S. side is essential to get to Peter's point of having the trade people at the table with the fishery people. Um, that is absolutely essential. And, you know, there's now this new White House um, task force that actually was passed during the national defense strategy um, this past this past January that mandates that coordination and NOAA is the lead for that. And so coordinating all those lines of effort, prioritizing across the different things, and then looking at how is our outreach to both countries and regions and, and around the globe. And so also to the point of, you know, some of our allies are also in this space of illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. You know, that's on us to do official demarches from the State Department to those countries um, allowing, you know, making it known that the U.S. has prioritized this issue and it's a high food security, environmental concern, uh, national security concern. And so I think there's a, a bunch of things in that space in terms of bringing people together. And then at the local level, what we've seen in this hemisphere is that our embassies, they are now having inter 
age inter U.S. government agency working groups on this issue. So I know Peru led the way, our embassy in Peru led the way putting together that group of the economic section, the political section, USAID, um, all of the players that encompass that space, NOAA, in one group on an embassy, in an embassy on the ground, so that then that group has consistent outreach to all of the players in a host country. Peter, how do you think about get bringing different government agencies together in the context of where you are? You have 17 different governments, but all, each of those governments have different they agencies. That's, that's a lot of, that, that adds up pretty quickly, Peter. But there, there, there are actually some mechanisms in place. Um, for example, I've already spoken about the regional working group, group on IOU fishing, um, which can be utilized as a, as a forum to by inviting some of these agencies or their representatives to sit in in the meetings of it. Um, the regional security system made up of, of Antigua, Barbuda, Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, um, St. Vincent the Grenadines, Barbados, um, uh, they, they have been playing an increasing role in dealing with interdiction. In fact, we've been doing some training with them. Um, we've trained over the past last three years, three years ago. Um, people in terms of fisheries prosecution and interdiction. So they've been coming together. We're having conversations with, with impacts. Impacts next week, I think, we'll be having a Coast Guard commanders um, meeting where the first annual, the first, the first um, ever Coast Guard commanders meeting, and we will be talking to them about the issue of IU fishing. So there are mechanisms in place and there are fora in place. I think people are now willing to get together to talk. We must just find the resources to bring them together to talk and the will to bring them together to talk. Because I think definitely more and more, especially as we've been starting to see IU fishing as another form of TNOC, transnational organized crime, then a lot of the crime people are starting to say, hey, let's take a look at that. So we, we have the mechanisms, but we have the will to do it. It's now the resources to bring them together. And that's where somebody like USAID um, can come in and support that. Excellent, excellent. Luis. Yes, uh, in Peru, uh, we have a this net. Uh, we had been working with uh, Global Fishing Watch to implement in Peruvian system, the new tools no, that in the Global Fishing Net, that uh, we need uh, training to the people of the uh, private sector and another uh, another uh, organization uh, interesting in the monitoring this is the distant water fleets it's, uh, it's possible with these tools uh, but these tools need uh, more efficient in the time because uh, the information has uh, uh, more delays. I want to give each of you a last parting thought, like one minute each, a parting thought. Let me start with you, Peter. Peter, if you you sort of just what's your message for this audience and for what's that what the next steps ought to be uh, for over the next year or two on IU fishing, Peter? Let me start with you. I always like the Nike motto, just do it. Um, we've got to actually get together. We don't need to get together. We need to take this thing seriously. We need to stop seeing it so much as a political thing, but as a people thing, a livelihood thing. It impacts on livelihoods and bring our resources together. Who can help each one help one as well, however we can. And that's in a nutshell how I see it. And I can go on and on and on, but that breaks it down. Okay, Luis, what is your parting thoughts about um, what the next steps ought to be from where you were from where you sit, Luis? Uh, socializing uh, this uh, idea because uh, all countries need to uh, work together. In this case, uh, with uh, a good information, Global Fishing Watch has a good information, but delays is the problem with the opportunity uh, information is possible uh, take action um, against the IOU fishing. Coordinate 
coordinate, coordinate, and cooperation. This is the, the final message. Great. Okay, Ambassador Mains, I'm going to give you the last word. <laughs> That's always dangerous, Dan. <laughs> So the last word is it's about way more than fish. And it is about national security, economic security, food sustainability, the environmental issues. And we have to have regional and international unity to hold all countries to international standards and be committed that we're not gonna allow what's happened off many coasts of countries in Asia and in Africa to happen in this region. We have to take urgent action to stop that and to agree to do it in a multilateral way. And so I would just say, you know, for me, traceability in the seafood industry is absolutely critical because that allows consumers to play an active role and start to change the dynamic on what we view as acceptable. This is great. I really appreciate the, the all of you participating in this day. I wanna thank our friends at AID and Environmental Incentives uh, I want to thank team CSIS as well for their hard work on this. This has been great. We are, continue to be very interested in working on these issues. There's a lot to be done here, clearly. Thanks, everybody. This has been excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right.